time, let's also hear out some macro opinion. India has been one of the key trend outperformers. That's the word coming in from Jonathan Garner, the Chief Asia and Emerging Market Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley, from the sidelines of the Morgan Stanley Annual India Summit. In a CNBC TV18 exclusive conversation with Lata, Garner adds that the good work by the Modi administration and the Reserve Bank has helped to de-risk India. We'll come back. Globally, we like equities, we mm. prefer equities to government bonds, and equities are underpinned by very strong earnings growth. We think for the all-country world index, the $35 trillion superset, we'll have something like high teens year-on-year -year earnings growth this year, oh. and another single-digit year-on-year earnings growth for next year, and that's the best back-to-back -back earnings growth environment we'll have had since 2006-07. Um, and that is a, a core underpinning of being bullish on, on stocks at this stage of the cycle. Um, and then if you go down to your question around uh, regional preferences, we actually think stocks globally will do well in most geographies. We have some specific areas we're concerned about sectorally or by country that we can go into. So we wouldn't want to make much of the sort of EM versus DM story here. Um, Formally, we do prefer U.S. and Japan to Europe and EM, okay. but it's not a very strong preference right now. Now, the reason why I began with that is already fund managers uh, are believed to be, uh, you know, overweight India more than the benchmark uh, uh, indicate. So, mm. uh, in that context, uh, where does India figure in your EM uh, pecking order? So we run a, a country uh, quantitative process that looks at 27 different countries in EM and Asia X Japan and India is one of our key overweights along with China and in fact in Asia the other overweight we have is Malaysia and some of our key underweights include uh, Australia and South Africa. And I think in India's case what we're seeing is a very nice uh, pickup in uh, earnings revisions and in ROE relative to the rest of the asset class and actually also in the dividend yield which has always been a weak spot for India versus the rest of EM. It's still lower than the rest of EM but it's picking up okay. somewhat and then we've got a, a nice macro underpinning so we have a pretty balanced current account, we've got inflation far more under control than in the past, we've got 10-year bond yields gradually moderating. Um, and that move to sort of a 6% or so 10-year bond yield is really helping local flows move out of bonds and other stores of wealth into stocks. Um, and then on your question about global investor positioning on India, yes, it's true that investors have typically been overweight India, and that's not been a bad call to make over the cycle. Um, India has been one of the key trend outperformers. Um, the other, ironically, is China, which investors have never overweighted. So that's one of the ironies, that you'd have been better off structurally overweighting both India and China, mm -hmm. but investors have typically always had the overweight on India. But the extreme overweight that we had at the end of 2014 into 2015, after the, uh, the initial uh, election result here and, and Mr. Modi coming to power, that has moderated. And we're now quite close to a sort of five-year average degree of overweighting of India within the EM portfolio. So that's not a particular headwind, the positioning story. So does that mean then, uh, Jonathan, that there is a chance of, uh, you know, if I further putting money into India uh, over, the, over the next, say, 12 to 18 months, given that the overweight had come down in the last one and a half years from, by almost 200 basis points. So is there a scope uh, or a room for the EFIs to further increase India weightage? Yeah, I mean, that, that could happen. But I think the biggest story is whether the overall asset class and equities generally get inflows. And we're certainly seeing that. We've had around 35 billion US dollars of inflows into emerging market equities this year in terms of all forms of investors, be they local or global. Mm -hmm. I touched on the local flows here uh, in India. Um, we're also seeing it flows into emerging market fixed income products, so that's quite supportive. Um, I think what begins to undermine this story would be if we got a return to a super strong dollar environment or if we got a very aggressive Fed and a big backup in the long end of the U.S. yield curve. So we're assuming that this benign environment globally for earnings is in place, but also that the cost of capital is not moved higher over our forecast horizon. Um, if we're wrong, it's more likely to be that we're wrong about the need for the Fed to raise rates more aggressively rather than that the near-term earnings environment uh, okay. deteriorates. So, so in, in that sense, how much, how much you, at Morgan Stanley you'll have penciling in, in terms of Fed rate hike in the next, say, 12 months from now? 
Well, if you look out to the end of 2018, it's probably five strokes six hikes, okay. which from us, which is a bit more bullish than the forward curves of pricing. So that's why I raise it as okay. an issue. And then obviously the Fed also is likely in September to communicate that the balance sheet is going to gradually, gradually reduce. And some people, not, not us, but some people think that would be a trigger for the long end of the yield curve to become less anchored and say the 10-year yield to move up to 3%. We think the 10-year yield is going to go to 2.4, 2.5 okay. over the next 12 to 18 months. But if we're wrong about that and we start to get a 3% or higher 10-year yield, then that narrows the differential to these declining Indian 10-year yield rates, and that would slow any further reduction, maybe even possibly reverse it. So we have seen this play out before in 2013, of course, but I would emphasize that at that point, the taper tantrum, India's macro balance was far less strong than now. The current account position was much worse. Uh, in particular. And so a lot of good work has been done domestically by the Modi administration and by the RBI and you know, other factors that have actually kind of de-risked India, not completely, but de-risked India somewhat from the global situation. Is that the key reason why India is the top pick for you in the EM basket, the performance of the Modi government and the reforms which they've been doing? So in this model that we run, we look at a number of different things. We look at valuations. I touched on some of that earlier in relation to metrics like dividend yield, price to book versus own history and peer group history. We look at what's happening to ROE trends, earnings revisions, but then we also have to have a macro component. And in that regard, the administration has, has helped significantly. Um, and that's allowed this uh, virtuous circle of, of a reasonable degree of currency strength and reductions in domestic bond yields to play out. Um, we don't think there's going to be another cut in short-term interest rates anytime soon. So you still have, I think, a, a central bank that is quite prudent in relation to monetary policy easing. Um, and again, in terms of how this might um, become more problematic, one of the things we would always watch is the oil price for India. Mm. It's quite helpful right now that the oil price is, is sort of softening here. But if we're wrong on that and we get into a dynamic of a rapidly rising uh, oil price, that, that could still cause problems for India. Okay. Can things go wrong in China? I mean, there's always the worry about debt yeah. and especially debt in the shadow banking space. So mm -hmm. can the second half disappoint in terms of growth? So China is interesting. I just came from our Beijing summit last week, and you certainly have uh, monetary policy tightening yes. beginning in China, but rather like the US, it's very slow and quite gradual. We wouldn't want to see their repo rate, their core short-term interest rate, going up much above three and a quarter, which is the level it got to in early March. If it went to five or six percent, that'd be more problematic. In relation to the debt, we think the peak of the growth of debt to GDP in China was last third quarter, August. And going forward with their very strong export recovery, which is part of the overall bullish global macro environment, they will probably be much less reliant on debt growth in this year than they were last year to drive their domestic growth. So uh, yes, there's always risks out there in relation to China to watch. But the key one for us is to make sure that the monetary policy tightening they're doing, which is the right stage of the cycle to be tightening, that it, it doesn't become too severe.